Usually, when one is obsessed with the legacy of their favorite writer, they focus not on his death and grave, but on his life and work. But then again, most people aren't buried in the middle of a desert at an unknown location. The difficulty, in the case of Edward Abbey, is that in memorializing him, in searching for his final resting place, all we find is the desert, the dynamic, timeless expanse where humans are ill-equipped to flourish. At Abbey's grave we are forced to confront the bare rock, the bright heat, the alien plants, the immense calm expanse, the incomprehensible scale and proportion of Abbey's country. And in the end we are left with nothing, a fleeting desert vista, a flash of wing and beating of feathers as a turkey vulture rises from the saguaro, standing guard over old Ed's grave. Ed's resting place in the Cabeza Prieta Desert of Arizona reminds us all that no matter how much we know a place, love it, protect it, write about it, or share it, we always find ourselves detached from it. In the end, we just give up and crawl into an old comfy sleeping bag, curl up under a juniper or an ocotillo or a slick rock ledge to become part of the landscape, part of the wilderness we have struggled our whole lives both to be a part of and apart from. For the last five years, I have been searching for the final resting place of Edward Abbey. Abbey is that nature writer from the Southwest that you may never have heard of. He is a champion of protecting deserts and wilderness and the inspiration for much of today's radical environmentalism. I am one of his readers and hold on to the belief that by finding his grave, I can reach some deeper understanding of Abbey and his country. The journey for me begins in Bozeman, Montana. I search for his grave because his words inspire me, because I appreciate landscape in the same emotional, artistic, scientific way that he did, because just as his words connected him to a very specific place, his choice of grave sites also connects him, very specifically, to a place. I too feel a connection to place, in my case the high plains and mountains of the northern Rockies. connected with that. Excuse me a second. Cabeza Prieta, may I help you? Uh, yeah, so I don't no, know. No one around I don't here know. has ever found it? And actually there, there are a couple rocks out there. Somebody has scraped EA, you know, like it's a petroglyph. Mm. But, you know, who knows? Some people say that he was just laid out there for the buzzards, and some say no, they buried him, and so who knows? Well, thank you. Maybe you know more about it than I do. <laughs> well, we've read into it a bit. That's sort of why we're here is looking yeah. for them. So. Yeah, well then, go with what you got. <laughs> I set out from Ajo, Arizona with my brother Eric and my girlfriend Megan. We head for Charlie Bell Pass on what constitutes the best, most traveled road in this part of the desert. From the pass, we get our bearings and ponder what hiking through this landscape must have been like for Abby and his friends. I feel sure that this time we are searching in the right place, and I look forward to finding the grave and sharing the moment with people who mean so much to me. Fortunately, 
I'm not left searching for a needle in a haystack. Abby's close friends, who lovingly carried out his last wishes to be buried at a secret grave in the desert wilderness, are fellow monkey wrenchers and authors themselves. Jack Loeffler and Doug Peacock have both discussed Abby's burial with enough descriptive odds and ends to point me on my way. Without their help, I would be left searching an area of 700 square miles. With their clues, I am able to narrow my search to half a mountain range. What I suspect, Ed would consider an area just large enough to make things interesting. Complicating our search is the fact that this area has become wilderness and had much access restricted since Abby became a fixture. This, I think, would please him immensely, and it requires that much of our search be done on foot. The best way to see the world, as per Abby's instructions. Unfortunately, this wilderness, like so many in the West, bears the distinction in name only. Our search continues with a jaunt to Temporal Pass, down what used to be a drivable road, then cross-country through this rock garden that is the Sonora Desert. The distribution of desert plants on the landscape is amazing in its level of seeming organization, and the term garden most accurately explains this spare landscaping. We approach Temporal Pass from the east and enjoy a steady incline to the top, the land promptly disappearing over a steep edge to the west. We can read the dry valley beyond like a map. We see the telltale sign of a vehicle moving on the Devil's Highway, the dust plume of another Border Patrol agent tracking to the west. It is said that Abby is buried in a low saddle with a good view, so we search the ridge in the vicinity of Temporal for a single headstone of natural rock with desert patina. One stone out of one million, one billion, somewhere along the backbone of the Growler Mountains. As we approach, we catch faint human voices in the breeze. We've been advised by the Fish and Wildlife Service not to investigate the pass, as law enforcement has deemed it too dangerous for the public. The voices vanish as we descend into the late day shade of the pass. The wilderness at this site is anything but. We find a well-worn path littered like a highway with water bottles, clothes, and food wrappers, but find no company. I feel like an archeologist of the modern migration. Seeing no sign of Abby, we move out of the pass. As we follow a faint trail beside a tiny intermittent stream, we pick up again the faint sound of voices in the pass behind us. As we sleep under the stars in the wide plain below Temporal Pass, I begin to lose hope. We shift our search to the southern end of the Growlers. I feel the desert's immensity with each step, and wonder if I could ever find the grave in this vastness. The heat permeates my thoughts. Why, if I have absorbed a sense of this region, seen the landscape from detailed minutia to grand vista, why do I still feel lost? Still feel like I'm coming up short? Perhaps it's because I, like Abby, I'm only a visitor in this place, can never be more. I don't have the thick skin and spines of the saguaro, the wings and feathers of the turkey vulture, or the water retention of the kangaroo rat. Perhaps this search is not meant to find the grave, but instead to find that this wilderness, with its scraps and scrapings of humanity, and the civilization still being built within it, are not so different from each other.
we will not find Abby's grave. Though how near it may have been, we can never know. The Growler Range is Abby's headstone. The passes and mountains each allow their own perfect view. The view Abby demanded from his grave for eternity. What Abby rallies us to is not so much a call to protect and appreciate wilderness, but much more importantly, to protect and create a civilization, a culture worthy of wilderness. For all his wit and banter, Abby always turned back, always returned to civilization. He always knew that society, not wilderness, needed help. Society, not wilderness, needed him. Each time Abby turned back, except the last time, when he went out to the wilderness in a worn sleeping bag, in the bed of an old pickup truck, that last time Abby was able to transcend the human condition, become a resident rather than a trespasser in the desert. Abby's grave is a place I search for because it is a beacon of a better civilization, a higher humanity with its roots its spirit under the sun, sky, rock, and saguaro of the desert wilderness. <laughs>